I would like to uh, introduce uh, you to the viewers as a professor of uh, neuroscience at the University College of London. And you've made substantial theoretical contributions to neurobiology, including the free energy principle. And you're a fellow of the Academy of Medical Science, past president of the International Organization of Human Brain Mapping, fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, Weldon Memorial Prize and Medal for Contributions to Mathematical Biology, honorary doctorates, including one from the University of Zurich. I have to say that's quite impressive uh, uh, CV that you have there. So I think I'd like to start with a few preliminary questions. And it really is how, in your view, as a preeminent neuroscientist, view the early and late childhood reading as creating models or frameworks of images, of concepts, of ideas, is that something that you have worked into your theory? Um, in, a, in a general way, absolutely. Um, you know, if you cast our job as neonates, as infants, as building models of the lived world, and our lived world comprises other creatures like us, and in particular sure. when we're very young, mum and dad and siblings and the like, um, then it becomes imperative to understand a world that is encultured. Um, and by that I mean things that come along, constructs that shape that world um, and make it sensible in the sense of making sense of the world. And language is, is probably what, you know, the sort of post child of that um, thing that has to be learned has to be instilled in your model of the world, uh, and in particular, making sense of dyadic interactions right from birth. You know, first of all, just sorting out whether um, your know, mum is me, or I am somehow different from mother. Am I in control of me? Am I in control of mother? Developing a sense of self. So, you know, the the act of inferring that mother is somehow separate from me, another creature like me, but not me. Right. Depends on, upon all sorts of communication, or initially affinitive touch. But within months, we now have the machinery of language. Um, and that machinery really does fast track that model learning, that um, you know, sort of building apt constructs and models that you can predict what's going to happen next. And indeed, of course, predict what you're going to do next, what you're saying next, right. inferring your intentions, your propositional stances and, and the like. So language then, um, you know, you just look at a school curriculum from, you know, sure. you know, you know, from the start, plays a really central role, um, you know, in, in scaffolding that model learning, that structure learning, that model building. You know, language uh, is, is a fascinating terrain. And of course, it goes from writing to printing to the current uh, internet way of which uh, language and images combined uh, on screens. And so I think there's been quite a different uh, approach and understanding of, of language and accessibility to language. Uh, and has that had an impact in terms of just the way our brains now generate models of reality? Is that su substantially different than before the invention of the printing press? Go back to the ancient Greeks where it was all oral storytelling. That's a, a really interesting question. Um, so I'm just thinking in my mind. So, so from, from my point of view, um, you know, language is the vehicle that provides a structure to the narratives that we bring to the table to understand what's happening you know, on the outside of our brains, right. you know, beyond our skulls. Um, and what you're effectively asking is, is the written word, is that point of reference, that consolidation, that crystallization um, of the, um, the cues and the structure um, instrumental in disseminating and improving the learnability of these narratives? I, I think so, absolutely, yes. Yes, I, I hadn't really thought about that, but it'd be fascinating to model that. Um, you know, you know, because language prior to the written word yeah. only lives in my head and your head, but once it gets yes. out into the proper third world, um, there's a there's a reference and a continuity there 
that I would imagine would be best seen as something that is sort of self-selecting in terms of hierarchical co-evolution that enhances the learnability of language. And right. The learnability of language in and of itself enhances the learnability of your generative models and your inference and your making sense, you know, making sense of the world. So, so, yeah, so, so in a sense to talk about communication as a heart of the language, we really have to, I guess, look at the medium in which the communication has occurred because the, to use Marshall McLuhan, the medium may be the message uh, that the way we construct our models will depend very much on the boundaries of that medium, the amplification of that medium, and, and the way that uh, we can use it for our purposes and purposes of the community. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, you, that speaks this notion or a notion of, of, of a shared narrative. You know, if, I, if I'm using my model of the world right. um, to understand you and make sense of you, um, effectively, if I assume that you've got the same kind of model that I'm using, then our narrative is is literally a shared narrative. It's 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 it, you know it's not mine nor yours. It is something that we're we're sort of um, committed to together. So that you know the, the, that that shared narrative um, is something that we have to aspire to and learn together. So you know it is defined cooperatively again in an encultured in an encultured way. Yeah. Uh, and the modalities and the shared commitments to the way that we use language, whether it's in print or indeed, you know, one could even argue that mathematics is, uh, you know, a, a kind of language that only works because there's a shared commitment to using this modality, right. these shapes, these kinds of sensory cues to enable me to infer what you are thinking and what you're going to say next. The uh, the other preliminary thing I wanted to raise is I've been fascinated because I've seen a number of your interviews, particularly about the Markov blanket, uh, which is probably would take a whole show just to go through that. And I'll let you introduce what that concept is, but whether the kind of generative models that we get as a child from our reading experience, could it be said that those form a kind of Markov blanket? Uh, in a sense, it explains to me cognitive biases. A cognitive bias are the defenses against basically contrary or hostile images or thoughts or ideals or principles. And so we have a cognitive bias. We have, for example, confirmation bias. We look for those articles, those books, those peoples that confirm our beliefs and values. Yeah, no, I think that's that's an excellent point. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, cognitive biases you could actually read as as sort of um, Bayes' optimal biases. They, 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 you know, so if you subscribe to the free energy principle that rests upon Markov blankets, you are in the game. All of us, anything that exists, is in the game of securing evidence for our own existence, which just means evidence for our models of the world. So you're going to seek out confirmation, and if you're successful in seeking out confirmatory evidence that you exist and you've got a good model of the world, you exist for longer. So it's an almost tautological truism that what you've just said is, is absolutely right. One of the things that you were, I heard you say on another interview, and I love this in the context particularly of fiction and novels, if you are constantly surprised, you've had a bad model of the world. <laughs> So in a, in a way, you you can judge the cognitive equipment that a person has, how it's been shaped by how surprised they are. So I, I guess the wider your reading is as a child in many different genres and styles and periods, the less surprised you're going to be when you see something because the range of activity that would have to surprise you would be vastly greater. Yes, no, absolutely. In fact, um, we actually use um, measures of surprise as um, measured by uh, electrical brain responses from people with autism or schizophrenia. Um, uh, you know, just to, to just to, to get a physiological handle on this. So you're absolutely right. We, you know, people do actually use surprise or oddball responses to sort of phenotype 
um, various conditions uh, where people may have difficulty inferring what's going on, going, 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 going on around them. So, uh, but you, you also um, bring to the table you know, the breadth of reading, the, um, the different kinds of outcomes and exchanges with your environment, cultured or not, sure. um, will certainly shape and be essential um, in determining the shape of, of the model that you you know that you um, you take forward into later life, and if you have a, um, a a model that generalizes to different situations that you can predict synthesize in a way that renders it unsurprising when sufficient information has been secured, yeah. then you're certainly going to have a better model that is more context sensitive and will underwrite a, a longevity in a changing world or in a very context sensitive world. I'm just wondering where, uh, again, getting back to uh, reading books and fiction in particular, where imagination and creativity fit into uh, your view of, of modeling uh, and generating models. Because although you may be surprised, surprise, for example, if you're an improv musician is actually a good thing. Yeah, you can yeah. riff off of that so that yeah. you, you, in a sense, you invite the surprise. And when you're writing fiction, uh, in some ways, you're looking for the surprise because that's what the reader wants. The reader is looking to be surprised uh, because if it's just all predictable, they say the book is boring. Yeah, and another, another excellent point. And, and um a key issue in the philosophy of the free energy principle, which rests upon something called the dark room problem. You know, if we just want to minimize surprise, why don't we go and seclude ourselves in a dark room and stay there forever? And yeah. then we'll never be surprised. Um, but that sort of kind of misses the point. Um, if we are curious creatures that are always in the um, compelled to resolve uncertainty, then the resolution of surprise or expected surprise as a consequence of our actions um, is going to be one of the, the primary drives uh, for surprise minimization. So we have to look for the opportunity to minimize surprise. So we, we listen to stories, we watch um, uh, TV series, we read books, sure. because we know at the end there will be a denouement. There will be a resolution of uncertainty. Um, and if you read uncertainty as expected surprise, you know there's going to be a, a wonderful opportunity for that aha moment when you've, your surprise, mathematical kind of surprise, right. um, is actually is actually resolved. And I think that's a great explanation for music. You know that you set up um, an uncertainty sure. in terms of the way that this riff could go, or you know what's going to happen in the next few bars, and then you're compelled to continue listening, actively listening, in order to resolve that uncertainty. But it's the resolution of uncertainty that drives novelty-seeking and curious behavior. And I repeat, if uncertainty is expected surprise, the resolution of uncertainty is a minimization of this mathematical kind of surprise. Right. So one, one of your papers I would certainly recommend uh, that viewers have a look at is in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews, November 2020 issue. It's a brilliant paper that looks very closely at the whole notion of generating models and the, the commitment of the brain as this constructive organ. We are constructing models and testing them against reality at every stage. And when somehow the model isn't quite working well, as I understand from the paper, it's then we go into a question and answer. What are we missing in the context of this thing? Why is it a little bit off? Or is our model off? Do we have to adapt it in order that we see more clearly the reality that's there? In other words, it's not anything other than we have low information. And what we're seeking is to increase the level of information so that we have a better understanding and explanation of what happens next or what may happen next. Yeah, that, that, that is a beautiful summary of the essence of active inference. Absolutely. And I, I think it touches on you know, the, the last exchange in relation to you know, why we are compelled to be curious. Why are we curious creatures? 
and and that you know, it all boils down to this minimization of um, or resolution of uncertainty um, entailed by our current models and state of affairs in the world. So mm. how do you resolve that? You resolve that uncertainty by gaining information. How do you do that in the optimal way? Well, you you basically um, respond to epistemic affordances. You you know where to find um, the right kind of information that's going to resolve your uncertainty. So you listen to that news channel. You read that author. Um, you 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 go to that Wikipedia service. Sure. Um, so you 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 know what you don't know. And asking questions, querying the world, is the optimal way to minimize your uncertainty. So you can actually write this down in terms of a, you know, an expected free energy or an expected surprise. And if, again, um, I ask you to read expected surprise of, as uncertainty, right. then minimizing this expected free energy, following an action, following a move on the world, is um, you know, inevitably... Um, re- uh, compels you to gain the most information that resolves your uncertainty about the world. And interestingly, of course, the the degree of epistemic attractiveness or affordance of a particular move, a particular question, a particular query, you know, the choice of things that you might read, um, depends upon your current belief state. It depends upon what you know and what you don't know. So, of course, you could get bored when you've been foraging epistemically yeah. and there's no more uncertainty so then you'd move on to move on to something else and you know our work suggests that that sort of epistemic motivation that in um, neuro robotics for example this is known as intrinsic motivation just you know what would happen if i did that resolving uncertainty um, about the way that the world works that's probably much much more important than simple sort of utilitarian pragmatic parents right. like you know being rich or um uh if you're a monkey getting fruit uh, fruit sure. drops in, in in an experiment so i think that resolution of uncertainty that information game um is underwrites most sentient behavior in uh, systems like like us um and you know, not every system needs this. You know, viruses and thermostats you know, sure. wouldn't have this epistemic. But I think at a certain level, when your generative model is sufficiently deep and prospective, and it has to be in order to cope with living in a world that is constituted by other things like you that are also very deep and prospective, um, you know, then you become equipped with a model that entertains the consequences of your action. And of course, if you measure the consequences in terms of what matters, then the only thing that matters is getting down that expected surprise, that expected free energy, which just is being curious. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned the word curious because it seems to me that curiosity is not equally distributed. Some people seem to be far more curious than others, maybe to their Darwinian disadvantage, but there, there is a range of curiosity. And I'm wondering if that correlates with creativity and imagination. Yeah, you- I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it does. Um, you know, so technically, um, what I think we are talking about here is in the cognitive neurosciences, something called structure learning. So we're talking about the structure of our models. Um, if you're in machine learning and you're doing deep learning, for example, sure. how many how many layers would yeah. you have in a hierarchical model? Um, if you're um, a neurodevelopmental developmental psychologist and you're uh, you want to know what particular you know, at what point do different levels in the auditory hierarchy or the language system come online. Um, what we're talking about is building models literally by wiring in different components. So but you have to know the structure. And of course, you can't know the structure. All you can do is explore different structures, see whether they're fit for purpose, see whether they explain the data at hand. Um, but um, And therefore, you have to explore different models. And I think this is where creativity and imagination comes in. It's the ability to um, think about counterfactual um, 
structures in the world. You know, what would happen if the world was like this or with, or like that? You see, you've got these counterfactuals in place, these differential hypotheses. You can then use your sensory exchanges with the world or with others right. or with books um, to actually evaluate one um, model in relation to, to another, literally using the, you know, the, uh, the model evidence, the evidence of that model inherent in, in, the, in the sensory data. So that's how statisticians and people in machine learning actually optimize the structure of their models. No. And I think that's exactly what we do during neurodevelopment and, and subsequent experience-dependent learning. Uh, and what would that look like? It would look like um, you know, a creature, a system, an agent, who entertains, in a very creative way, different compositions, different structures, different constructs um, that could possibly explain their world, and then testing out the evidence yeah. for these different for these different uh, constructs. And if you're an artist, the way that you might do that is just by looking at the reactions of other people, or indeed your own reactions to something that's now out there. It's been sure. realised physically. Um, you know, in terms of a story or in terms of in terms of a picture so imagination would be if you like um sort of online uh, structure learning and creativity um that allows you just to um on the fly moment to moment just consider different hypotheses about what's going on now but exactly the same sort of mathematical imperative i think underlies um, the building of the structures themselves during neurodevelopment and during our ongoing um, reorganization of, of our brains and, and the concepts that are entailed by, by that structure learning. Yeah, counterfactuals are interesting. And I'm wondering if that's something that is taught along with early childhood reading as well. Is that, in a way, you could say Shakespeare may have had a right, is that you know, all life is a stage and we're all actors on it. And that childhood reading is a series of scripts in which you see the human drama unfolding in front of you. And by understanding that, you're understanding what's expected of you socially. You understand what are the boundaries of behavior, what you can expect from others. So in some ways, it prepares you to enter society because you don't have to have experienced directly. You can experience indirectly thousands of relationships going back hundreds of years and have a whole generative model of the human condition from that early reading. So part of it is, can you teach things like counter counterfactuals? For example, can you teach your, your child, take Hamlet, put him in Waiting for Godel. Take Godel, put him in Hamlet. How does it change the story? Yeah, uh, uh, I think that's absolutely right. And, and, and you started off that, that, that thesis with the notion of scripts. Um, and I think scripts is, you know, um, a very nice way of, of thinking about the different kinds of models that, 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 that are going to be plausible, going to be allowable um, um, when self-modeling. You know, when you know, because the most important thing is basically a model of the world, a model of the lived world is essentially a model of me in a particular world. So you know, most of the most of the pressure on early learning is just finding out. You know, um, first of all, am I separate from my mother? If I am, what bits of the world can I move? Is it, you know, sure. which bits of my so, so distinguishing between my body and non-body, mm -hmm. um, and clearly as one gets more sophisticated and more skilled, then one develops quite quite a, um, a sophisticated and deep, literally with hierarchical depth, generative model of me. But of course, that entails the kinds of things that I do and the kinds of things in this world, in this culture, uh, things like me do. So I think that's, you know, um, you know one way of looking at scripts and that has to be learned you know and as you i think you're, you're you're sort of highlighting using culture using enculturalism that brings with it these deontic cues these these counterfactuals that say well you can be that kind of person or that kind of person or possibly more relevant in this setting you'll be that kind of person in that setting you'll be this kind of person um just to give us to scaffold 
and to provide priors, you know, empirical priors, we call them mathematically priors that are if you like, informed by experience and the structure learning and evidence accumulation that, um, that shape the structures that you will entertain. Um, and of course, you know, if we are, um, 99% of our time is, is, is basically spent modeling the embodied me in some transaction or interaction with the embodied you, then um, a lot of these scripts are going to pertain to the kinds of things, the behaviours, the social norms um, that would apply in that context. Uh, I do emphasise the context. You know, I, I think we can be different people in different contexts. We can contextualise our models um, sure. uh, um, in the same way that if I was bilingual, I would, you know, I would contextualise my narrative or the spoken narrative, um, given you know what I thought you would understand and, and, and I would understand stand from uh, from you and having that context sensitivity that underwrites the generalization of one model for multiple contexts is this context sensitivity so the greater the latitude right. of scripts you have in front of you i think the more apt you will be to cope with any new context in later life uh, you know I, I i think stories you know even down to the level of of, of reading fairy tales you know, mm -hmm. at bedtime you know some of the some of the sort of um most um caricatured but but enduring shakespearean um um memes or structures or scripts are all there you know i i'm i'm a um, a fairy princess or I'm, uh -huh. I'm some sort of hero or you know all the all the grim fairy tales for example they have that sort of life structure in them that I would imagine most people would be able to identify with one character from a fairy story that you know five years later will be one character in their in their favorite Enid Blyton book or uh, you know whatever children read nowadays through sure. to uh, you know the political and and um, uh, other uh, dramas that we read 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 in, read in adolescence. So I, I think that's absolutely right. And probably um, you know there must be a vast literature in terms of Evo Devo. The sort of combination of um, development psychology, developmental psychology, and evolution. So this notion that you know, your evolution is just not the selective pressure acting upon a person, no. but the person builds uh, is in a particular environmental eco niche that is you know again massively and deeply encultured um and because we if you like shape that culture and that eco niche that that encultured eco niche um then um the eco niche itself now becomes subject to selective pressure at another level. So there's this sort of nice dance between the environment learning about oh. the denizens and the phenotypes in that environment and learning about, you know, learning the culture sure. of this environment. And they both have to be, like, be optimal hand in hand as, as we go forward. You know, one of the things, uh, uh, continuing on with the, uh, the idea of scripts, is that is reading uh, losing its grip, losing its grip in culture and society as one of the main forces to learn the scripts that are the models that are generated in order to understand a uh, theory of mind of others, to understand yourself and understand the world? I mean, wh what in your view, because a lot of people now are reading less, they're, they're getting their information from uh, TV programs, I mean, that's been going on for 50 years, but with the internet, there's a lot more distractions so that the kind of scripts that may be uh, taught these days are short scripts, as opposed to book length scripts that go into some degree of complexity. I just wondered if you could react to that. Yeah, I, I can, but I, I get to react as a pure layman. I have no professional insights here. I do know people, um, um, who, you know, who make this their life work, um, and I think it, it's a fascinating area. But you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to say that's a you know a, a, an incredibly engaging point, um, especially with the advent of social media and the you know the increasing. Um, potency of adverts mini films within within 10 seconds now you know designed 
to provide extremely information-rich, uncertainty-resolving material, precisely tuned for brains that can only attend for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, even to, you know, um, synchronizing the, um, the, the cuts and the editing with, sure. with, with the natural tempo of our eye movements and the way that we visually palpate the world. So, so you know, will that have any material effect on the the temporal depth of the narratives and the scripts that we we sort of start to inscribe in our generative models sure. of you of, you know, of um, the, the self of, of me of different kinds of me that that I could possibly be? Um, I, 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 again, as a layman. I, I I would be surprised if if there's any real damage being done. To be quite honest, you know, um, you, you know, the, 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 there's long stories that with, with with the long term denouements are still intensely attractive from an epistemic point of view and and, and in terms of identifying with characters and the like. Um, so there is there is ample evidence that people still want the long stories. Um, unfortunately, it may not be, and, and you'd have to ask me why I say unfortunate, um, but um, unfortunately, it might not be the, 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 the textual story. Uh, mm. But certainly, if you look at things like Game of Thrones or your favorite yes. police dramas or season one of you know, the, the, the next HBO um, you know, mega, mega drama series, these, these are structured long narratives, um, which, people, um, the, the, you know, which people are still... Um, find um, unavoidable, and, you know, and, and, and will commit to. So, uh, you know, in terms of of um, there being a sort of sea change in, um, you know, short, sharp, fast, trivial, not trivial, but um, you know, fast narratives with early closure, scripts with early closure. I'm sure that there is there are lots of opportunities to indul indulge in that. But on the other hand, there's plenty of evidence, I think, that, that what people actually commit to when they settle down, especially during the coronavirus pandemic, sure. um, to, you know, to, to, to do the, to go through their box sets. The box sets are, I think, an epitomization of the long stories. And of course, the best box sets are those that translate in an easily digestible form the best books so you know, so, yes. uh, you know i would I, 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 I be more optimistic than, than one might think uh, from, from a lay perspective <laughs> well i i i think i i appreciate you sharing that i'm just curious as to whether it might have implications for your own mapping pro program and your own notion of generative models because the way we generate models depends on an input. And if the input is a book, you're going to generate one class of models. If you're playing, say, computer games, which uh, I don't have anything against, I think it's actually those they're fun, but you're generating a different kind of model making about the world. And, yeah. and those, those do make a difference because if you say communication is a shared activity, and there, in a reading culture, you share the activity, although you read alone, you share those books intellectually with those around you in your culture. If that culture starts to shift, then you're sharing them with a smaller group of people who model according to books as opposed to, say, playing computer games. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. Um, and, you know, one aspect of that point um, brings us to um, an important sort of paradigm shift um, at the end of the 20th century, which was towards sort of an embodied perspective, an inactive perspective, a situated perspective mm -hmm. um, on sentient behavior, which um, tries not to, to deny the key role of the physical way in which we sample our information, get our information from the world. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, on some radical accounts, the very physical um, embodied act of um, sensory, uh, you know, soliciting sensory information from the world could be read as, as perception. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think one, one attractive example of that um, is the the finger fluency that teenagers now, in fact, millennials now have in terms of being able to type on, on, on an iPhone. Now, I don't have an iPhone, 
<laughs> so I just don't have this fluency. But they, they will have a substantial part of their motor and premotor and supplementary motor area devoted to this fluency, which um, you know, that would parallel um, <laughs> parts of my broker's area, problems area 44, that I devote to using more my favourite words uh, you know, when, when writing them down. So there will be physical differences in sure. our motor compens- our, co- our communicative acts um, that will be written into and entailed by different brain structures and different fluences. So I think that's absolutely right. Um, you know, so the new authors may, 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 may not now be people who are writing books. They may be people who are engineering games. Uh, yes. you know, and so there's more money in that than there is writing books. Um, um, I can attest you know, to that. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, if you just want the money, that, um, um, well, that may or may not be a good thing. Um, I, you know, and it begs the question, is that a good thing or, or, or a bad mm. thing from an evolutionary perspective? It, you know, you know I, I make no judgments, but it certainly is a, re- a reality um, you know, you, that you could reverse engineer. If you gave me a young person's brain from um, 2015, relative to a young person's brain in, in 1915, there will be structural differences. And if I understood the nature of the genetic models entailed by their brains, I will be able to say that this is the kind of, uh, you know, youngster who um, who reads books and, uh, you know, um, and I will be surprised to see um, gross differences between, you know, all of their friends, uh, you know, in, in their you know, conspecifics or their in-group, whereas the millennial um, uh, no. subject would have a different kind of brain who would have different kinds of fluences and you'll be able to see, well, this is the kind of um, new reader who probably does sure. engage in narratives by watching um, Netflix or playing games online with their, with their, um, you know, with, with their friends and siblings. So as a neuroscience, you could see uh, same territory, but different maps. Yeah. yeah is what nice it yeah. Yeah. The way it comes, you, you can see the, the mapping uh, has been a, a, of a different kind and different quality. But you, the territory is recognizable, but the map of the various trails and where you're going is takes some use to getting used to because you don't have that part of your brain which has looked at that kind of map before. Yeah. You don't have that sort of physical language. You can't articulate. And if you can't articulate, if you can't do, then you can't see, you can't right. understand. Uh, you know, so, so you know, the, the essence of um, understanding others um, is this, the notion of this shared narrative, which means that if I see you doing something, then I can use my models of the kinds of things that I do to infer what you intend. And you know, so if I, if I can't do something, um, um, then I can't understand, I can't make sense of, um, of you if you did the thing that I cannot do. Um, so I, you know, th- that's not a sort of mystical statement. It, you know, it, it, really, it really does um, um, bite hard, say, in neurology, where people with Parkinson's disease may have difficulties adopting certain facial expressions or responding swiftly in terms of initiating certain kinds of movements, which means that they can't do it. But crucially, they can't recognize those kinds of actions as communicative acts in other people. So you just lose the language. So I could never, in any true way, understand what a finger, thumb no. flicking sure. youngster on the tube is is trying to do because I just don't have that as part of my generative model. So I can't model them. They are another species for me. I mean, you know, you're not in any um, malignant way, but they are, they are now a different generation. And I am right. not part of that generation. There will always be a communicative barrier, uh, which is not a bad thing, but there will always be that, be that barrier simply because they have a different way of expressing. And I think it comes to the notion which, um, you 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 brought to the table earlier on about the modalities. You know, the modality um, does um, entail the kind, the physical ways in which we communicate and which we which we share narratives. Um, mm. And you know, if I don't have, if I don't speak that language, or I am not able to 
uh, play a particular computer game or I'm not a subscriber to Netflix, then, then there is going to be a, you know, a fundamental uh, disaggre disaggregation or disaggregation uh, of, of different cultural groups, um, you know, being generational or, 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 or clinical. Literally no longer speaking the same language, which is often a, a, the way a generational divide is, is put. But there's yeah. a, a breakdown of communication because the medium in which communication is used is, is just different enough. It's just like if you hear a dialect, uh, even in your own native tongue, you still have to strain a bit. You may pick out some words, but there'll be other words which are not familiar to you. If you go to Edinburgh, you're going to find maybe in, in a pub there that there's someone you're, you're missing some words uh, which are common to everyone there, but are not common for you. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, the, the dialect is very interesting because, you know, that, that introduces a degree of uncertainty. So, you know, if you just think about what things are we attracted to and the valence of things, and if the, the key imperative is indeed this um, uh, um, uh, imperative to resolve uncertainty, then the uncertainty induced by what did she say? You know, right. it starts to become slightly aversive, and 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 it is that kind of noisiness, that 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 sort of uncertainty, which you which irreducible uncertainty, which you will ignore, and you'll go to another more reducible kind of uncertainty. Yes, this is my kind of book. This is my kind of story. This is you know this this is this is a TV series for my age group because I understand what's going on, and at the end I will get mm -hmm. that to Newmont. I will resolve that uncertainty. But if you infer you never, you know, for example. Um, you know, new kinds of uh, popular music sure. that, that, you know, that just do not, you, you don't have a generative model for, you can't predict what's going to happen next. You will actually find them, find them quite aversive because they do not afford the opportunity to resolve uncertainty, to improve your model of the world um, you know, in any meaningful way. Uh, and you, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll stick to, as you get older, you will certainly stick to yeah. kinds of uh, sources of information that, that do have that epistemic affordance. So, I mean, there, there, there is kind of an emotional uh, homostasis that I think that people naturally drift to. So if there's something that is incoherent, not particularly understandable or pleasant, they either avert their eyes or pretend that they didn't see it. And yeah. the, the, this, this is part of, of, of human nature, of what you choose to see and what you choose not to see. And it goes back to John Berger, ways of, of seeing, and again, I think that comes uh, from from reading, which I think is a segue in. Let's go take a time machine back to York. You're now about ten years old. None of the medals, none of the accolades, or the fellowships are there. You're a boy reading a book. Tell me a little bit about the that environment in which you are reading a book. Um. It's an environment that is shaped very much by my family, particularly my my parents, really. So I think to to understand um, that environment um, and the books that I would pick up and read, um, um, you have to understand wh wh the, the, why those books were there. So my mother was 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 um, a nurse. Um, um, and when she got married, it was in the age where, where um, it was, you know, the scripts were that you sort of invested in, 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 your, in your children as a mother and the father went out to work. My father was a, a civil engineer, um, which meant we had to move around the country very much like an army child to wear the new structures. Mm. He was actually a, a, a motorway bridge engineer. Uh, so we had to move around the country and he spent a lot of time on site. So uh, I had this curious mixture of an extremely bright man um, with a passion for um, physics and engineering and an extremely bright mother whose only focus at that time was how to bring up children properly. <laughs> so, she, so she got me some, uh, Very lucky. <laughs> uh, uh, loads of um, books on um, psychology, popular psychology, uh, um, all, uh, for, for, for her edification and um, enrichment. 
that was nice a nice compliment to my father's books, which were largely all engineering, and his favourite book uh, was Space Time and Gravitation, and I and I uh, by Sir Arthur Eddington, um, and I only found out about four years ago um, how favourite that book was because apparently when trying to court my mother when they're in their teenage years, he'd made her read it as well. To try. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my mother did, did her best, apparently. She never told me. This, so, that that uh, had to be true love. <laughs> <laughs> because so, you know, I, it's the only book on your list. You have seven books. I, I, I have never heard of this book, so I did a little bit of research. The the most recent review I could find was in the Bulletin of American Mathematical Society, January 1921. And the only place I could find to buy a copy was Walmart Canada's website for $89.40. It also said, the other two pieces of information, it had no reviews. And two, it was almost sold out. <laughs> <laughs> So please tell me what age you read this book. Your mother read it as a teenager. How old were you when you read this book? I'm, I'm, it would have been, I must have been about um, 10 or 11 years of age. Oh I, I read it several times. Um, um, uh, but it was, it was, it was um, at a time where we were actually having maths le- lessons at school. So, so the, the narrative, the language of maths was starting to, to emerge. <laughs> um, and um, so, so the, 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 I'm surprised there were, there were no reviews of it because it, it was, um, it, it, you know, I think latterly it's seen as a classic in the sense that it was the only accessible way that an informed um, sort of early 20th century um, layman could get a good handle on general relativity and Einstein's notions. So Sir Arthur Eddington, the, the, the author, um, was, was famed really for, for being able to translate Einstein's ideas into a way that, um, that enabled um, people like you and me to, you know, to grasp the, the essence of it. Um, and it's still, I think, a very readable, um, readable book if you want to understand the, uh, the, you know, not only what is relativity, but uh, general relativity, but also um, you know, how you might take those baby steps conceptually and possibly mm-hmm. how Einstein and people at that time were thinking and in, in thinking out of the box and, you know, logically arguing themselves to the way that this world must be. So we're coming back to some generative models of a, of a very grand sort here, uh, certainly in the context of physics. So, um, so, you know, that, that was my, that was probably my favourite, um, favourite book because, it, you know, it really did have that epistemic affordance that we were talking about. It really did um, not only engender a whole space of counterfactuals about the way that the, the physical universe could uh, could work, um, but also provided a denouement in terms of resolution of uncertainty. So the big thing about um, the story that um, that book tells, which is basically a story of um, conceptual exploration in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the way that the physical universe might might be structured. Mm-hmm. But it was written by somebody who was actively involved in securing the evidence for it. Um, His uh, 1919 expedition to ex- uh, absolutely. off the absolutely. coast of Brazil yeah. for the eclipse. So, no. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's a great, you know, in terms of science history, it must be such an exciting time, uh, yeah. you know, for, for, for scientists who also were explorers and adventurers and uh, it was an adventure story as well as uh, an exploration of science. Is that what really kind of hooked you on science uh, at 10 years old? Was this book? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think as, as with most um, uh, people who subsequently became natural philosophers or natural scientists, uh, you know, in, in the Victorian sense, um, those opportunities to find out how things worked um, Again, had this epistemic affordance that was irresistible, and that particular book just just took you to the edge. Um, and you know, if you ever have the chance to read it, you you will you will see that it actually starts off with exactly um, something that we we've, we've already focused on as a fundamental way of engaging with the world, which is questions and answers. You know, right. if 
if the purpose, if we are here in virtue of being curious creatures, um, then what does that mean? It means that we basically seek answers. And how do we do that in, a, in an informed and efficient way? We have to ask the right kinds of questions. So questions and answers okay. um, uh, you know, are central to model building and then living in the world. Uh, and interestingly, space, time and gravitation starts off with a conversation that is just a series of questions and answers between, behind, you know, from and between three protagonists with slightly different perspectives on the way the world works, you know, mathematician and the physicist and so on. Uh, so it actually starts with, with just a conversation. Uh, so you can, and that's what I meant by, you know, it's a, it was a fascinating insight into the way that people were asking their questions and offering answers some correct, some incorrect, um, at that time. But it really pulls you in as well, because you would be wanting to ask that question, and you want to hear what the answer was. So it was very compelling reading. Just just the first chapter, you know, and it's a device that I've subsequently used in, uh, when writing with friends in, uh, you know, in philosophy proper, um, as the best way to get to the heart of a matter, you know, to sort of get into the narrative through a series of questions and answer. But then the adventure, as you said, the, 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 the practical adventure of going off and doing these experiments, you know, um, uh, and the history of experiments that underwrite this, you know, this particular um, view of the world, which was very different. I mean, that's something very refreshing about, about you know, the way that, you know, Arthur, Sir Arthur Eddington, paints a picture of the universe where, where they have different shapes, you know, well beyond does the universe have an edge? Uh, you know, what's sh- what shape is it? Is it hyperbolic? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a notion of it at the end of the edge of the universe even exist. Does it close back on itself like a big circle? What about hyper, you know, also, hang on, you, I never thought of that. Yes, yeah, so of course it could be like that. Uh, yeah, and it was just so fascinating just to, Again, a little bit like you know, the counterfactuals that we were talking about before, the different ways that it could be, which you you know you never imagined, but now you had. And once you'd had that experience of imagining another another way of looking at things, mm-hmm. then that made it easier just to entertain other kinds of counterfactuals. And of course, that's the mark of a good scientist. A counterfactual is just a hypothesis. The mark of a good scientist, a natural philosopher is asking the right questions hmm. by bringing counterfactuals or alternative hypotheses to the table. So, and that takes imagination. And yeah. from imagination, you're going to have creativity coming out of that because yep. the more you can imagine, the more you can create and construct and different models. So you're learning this at 10 years old, uh, a book which was read by both of your parents that actually was a condition for the, the father's decision to want to marry the mother, and she went along with this. So did this become something that you talked about in the family? Did it become kind of a family uh, uh, touchstone, space and time and gravitation? I mean, it has everything, all the questioning and answers, the process of inquiring the world. I mean, did these things come up at home? Not at all. No, I had to. My <laughs> mother was completely non mathematical. <laughs> would have, would, would have, have told my father off if he introduced that in family conversation. So, no, no, this is all under, under the cover. It was all <laughs> implicit. Um, um, you know, my, my father um, sort of, you know, w- 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 was a was a great educator, but but in the best way possible in terms of just providing learning opportunities. So he gave me a slide rule and said, "How does that work?" And never spoke about it again. But I spent months working out how a slide rule worked at that age, sure. age ten to eleven. So before I ever met the concept of a logarithm in mathematics, I already had a fundamental understanding of yeah. you know the arithmetic and geometric transformations and the role of logarithms. Simply, be, you know, trying to appease my father because he'd mm. asked me a question uh, i never told him the answer <laughs> and i think that space time gravitation was one of those devices he said read that yeah it's like the uh, slide ruler uh, yeah but i do know i did notice it was interesting you managed to trace down a copy although we never discussed it i mean we do discuss things now you know, uh, you know, you know now he's retired but uh, not in the not in those days but it is interesting that after I had read it, um, you know, several times over the years, uh, before I left home, he made sure he got the book back. 
and it's his, it's his, he's got it down in his favourite bookcase uh, at home. And he won't let me have it until until he passes. Uh, so, so, yeah. You know, for him, it was a very important book as well, but but it was all done silently. No, my mother would not have um, found those kinds of counterfactuals at all entertaining. I repeat, she was much more into psychology and ways that people thought and think, you know, so she was much more verbal in, in her analysis. Um, um, so so the, 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 there wasn't discussion of general relativity around the table, sure. I'm afraid. No. I, I've heard you say as well that Underlying everything, the the foundation is mathematical. Uh, that mathematics is is the place that you start, and then you go up from there to explain the world. And I'm wondering again if this book, Space and Time and Gravitation, was one of the early influences for that view of reality, of model making, starting with a mathematical equation. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's both true that I. Um, have said and believe that um, mathematics, I think, is the most efficacious language, um, the best shared uh, narrative that we have, um, um, that you know, that transcends most other spoken languages or written languages, um, and you know, its unreasonable efficacy boils down to its simplicity and it, and it, it's delicate but but um, um, beautiful structure. Um, so I think, you know, as a, as a vehicle, as a way of talking about ideas, and that, that ultimately has to be reduced to the formalism of mathematics before, before I think anybody else will understand it, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And not about now, but, you know, in five or ten hundred years' time, all the great advances, I think, um, uh, have, have or um, can be articulated mathematically. I'm just catching myself there because, of course, you know, you might argue that natural selection um, was a great biological idea that wasn't necessarily mathematically couched. But I think in terms of making um, natural selection work, then you would, um, you would certainly then formalise it in terms of genetic algorithms and, right. you know, Fisher, you know, price, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, um, uh, you know, the fundamental equations of, of, of evolution and the like, which actually are very close to the same equations that underwrite the free energy principle in terms of us as curious creatures making inferences about the world. Right. We are inference-making creatures, for sure. Let's turn to the first of the fiction choices, uh, one of my favorite, and I think favorite of many people, 1984 by George Orwell. Uh, what age were you when you first read 1984? Oh, I, I, I can't remember with any veracity. Um, I must have been, I'm just imagining where it was. It was on the bookcase at the bottom of the stairs where my mother kept her favourite books. Um, um, and in virtue of being in that house at that time, I must have been about uh, about about 12, yeah, 12 to 13. Yeah. 12. Okay. So you pull it off your mother's uh, book shelf was this a book that you just devoured over a day or two or you lingered over it for a longer period of time i think i probably devoured it i can't i'm quite a slow reader so now i mean in fact you know i have to confess since going to university and since you know committing to a rather hectic work orientated career i don't read for pleasure anymore because i have to review um scientific papers um and the occasional book nearly every day. So I just have no space for, for pleasure reading. So, but in those days, um, you know, you had the time and the space to, to, to do it for pleasure. And I probably was was quite voracious in, in going through it. So, you know, I, I, my mother had a collection of penguin classics. So yes. I just went from right to left. To go I remember it. that. I, I do remember 1984 as being particularly, uh, particularly compelling. Uh, yeah. There were, yeah, you know, there were other things that Aldous Huxley and the Doors of Perception, but 1984 was, you know, was quite enchanting and frightening. Yeah. Uh, so I do, I do remember that one quite, quite acutely. So I had gone through it quite quickly, um, you know, late into the night, under the covers, um, right. under the torch kind of uh, uh, stuff. What was, what did you find at 12 years old that was the most compelling part of 1984? Oh, um, this is a long time ago. I'm remembering this like you might might remember, a, a, you know, a dream, and not very well. So <laughs> I, you know, it's, we're talking over half a century since since I actually read it. Um, 
But the kind of the feeling that you had, can you remember that feeling, that experience? Yeah. Yes, it, it was just the horror of realizing that my comfy little world uh, shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, you know, when, when you know when the veil was slowly lifted on the kind of world that the protagonist um, in 1984 had to contend with, um, it was you know an eye opener that such societies, uh, you know, uh, such um, uh, cultures could could actually exist um, and may actually exist in other parts of the world. I didn't know at that, at that age. Sure. So it was just a revelation that there were other universes, universes of a cultural sort, of an attitudinal sort, or, you know, going back to these these sort of the norms that, um, you know, your, how should I behave in this context, in this, in, in this society? So that was, that was an eye-opener. And, I, and, and, you know, curiously, attractive because it was just so frightening uh and you know once you developed this hunger for uh, you know, another kind of culture another kind of society and what you couldn't couldn't do in that society and all sorts of things which must resonate with everybody you know uh, you know all the little phrases like room 101 double fish yes. all all of those classic things which you know whether or not you like the word meme, I think the meme applies to to these things. That, that once you've seen them, uh, they stay with you for, 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 for life. And so you know th- these these were you know every few pages was an eye opener. And of course, there was always this. I can't remember whether this is true or a false or a made memory now. But there's always this sort of notion that he could get out of the city and uh, you know and go off to these these green fields you know and escape with his with his girlfriend at some point so i love that as well uh, and i think that's possibly because um you know we, the, the way i was brought up in yorkshire the, the, there were two bits of my life there was sort of hard work sometimes actually getting used to being in a new school because moving around a lot you know, settling into a new uh, new environment, and then holidays off on the Yorkshire Moors. So I've always had this polish, this this sort of um, always liked reading about um, things like so far from the madding crowd, by, 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 you, know, um, you know, getting out there um, back to a quieter pace of life. And I I just remember that the, the, there was this sort of the, um, this was this escape for the protagonist in 1984. If he could get there, if he could realise it, but it was clearly never going to happen in any meaningful way. That was that was almost again quite a, quite attractive. Yeah, it, it, it was not the hobbits in that case. You know, this this was a pretty dark world in, uh, that's portrayed in 1984. And what, what's interesting is it's a book that has endured for uh, 60, 70 years now. In fact, I think it's about 70 years. I think it's now out of copyright in 1984. But let me just give you a couple of phrases here from from the book. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. In other words, your ability to do what you're talking about in your, your paper of asking questions, asking better questions, resolving the uncertainty. You no longer have the autonomy to do that. That has been stripped from you. Question and answers are over. This is the script, the only script. There are no questions, and we may change the script tomorrow. We may be at war against East Asia tomorrow, we may not. We'll let you know. That's uh, that's the world of 1984, and part of the horror of that is another of the quotes, not merely the validity of experience, but the very essence of external reality was tacitly denied by their partnership. There was, there's no generative uh, models uh, that are done independently uh, in 1984. Uh, it is, uh, a chilling book, uh, and it's a book that fits into some of your other early fiction as well. It's it's a statement about power, and those who seize seize power never voluntarily relinquish their power. Those, those, those were great excerpts. I've forgotten them about. It's all coming back now. <laughs> yes, so. It, 
I was wondering whether you were going to um, talk about the ghosts of that um, withdrawal of our um, life affirming, and I would say mathematically necessary um, um, quest for evidence for our own existence in, you know, um, uh, whether whether that was being recapitulated in the in in the, in the modern um, era by things like fake news, you know, in a sense you could imagine fake news is basically saying the truth does not matter. Obama, truth decay. There yeah. is no evidence of any worth out there anymore. Yes. I think that's equally frightening. Uh, but you know, but painted in black and white uh, by Orwell. I think that that's that you know, in the yeah. imaginative world. Well, it, it, again, let me give you a couple more uh, quotes. Uh, to refresh your recollection, he's talking about the ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, glittering, a nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, persecuting 300 million people all with the same face. And then power is tearing the human mind to pieces and putting them together again in new shapes of your choosing. Again, I, I could perhaps see a 12 year old uh, Carl reading this and some of this, it seems to me now is reflected in your own research and, and your, your own modeling is it is a way to showcase what the human brain mapping should be. It should be have the freedom, the basic freedom to generate models of the world without manipulation and without interference. Mm -hmm. That there should be some choice in this. And, and there's George Winston with his girlfriend, Julia, trying to find some small way to model a traditional relationship and being unable to do that, being bounded in in such a way that the only thing they could do was to submit. They could no longer question, they could no longer answer, but they loved Big Brother. So I think with uh, 1984, we find uh, a book where Again, curiosity comes up. In Orwell's world, there is no curiosity that's allowed. There's no creativity. There's no imagination. And so creativity and imagination go across just language. You go across music. It goes, goes across the mathematics that you use to describe the universe. Because it may, may disable and disable uh, institutions that have a vested view and what the model of the universe is. Copernicus. This is what you had your Copernicus moment when you were talking earlier about suddenly I understood growing up in York that York was not the center of the universe. There were things going on in other places that were quite terrifying. The way to interrogate the world was not universal. It was local. Yes, no, absolutely. And, and perhaps that was, I mean, you know, looking back, Clearly, you can see that kind of utopia is just not sustainable. It's everything. That, sure. Uh, so what, one way that people, um, philosophers, describe this sort of um, the, the ability to um, pursue life as a curious creature is self-evidencing. The, you know, the existence is just acquiring evidence, asking questions and acquiring the evidence for your own, for your own existence. So the, the, you know, just mulling over what the the, the excerpts that you've you've just um, shared with us, what that is describing is is completely unsustainable and is frightening because it cannot exist, or if it does exist, it won't exist for very long. It is the exact opposite of self evidencing that latitude, that creativity, that opportunity to ask questions, to reaffirm and then change my mind about you know my place in, in, in this world. So perhaps that's why it was curiously frightening. But as you say, very dark. Very, very dark. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a system, but you, you, a lot of what Orwell wrote about in, in the 40s, we can see playing out in various countries today. Where there are more totalitarian measures, authoritarian measures to limit free 
expression, which again, when I, whenever I hear limiting free expression, it's limiting the right to question. Question is to challenge. The challenge is, is the model may not be right. It needs improvement. We need better and more detailed answers. And that requires being able to say the current model is flawed. And so you have millions and hundreds of millions of people who don't want the questioning, who are quite happy to have the party decide what the truth is and that everything else is false. Are they happy? Good question. Good question. Whether that brings some kind of emotional resolution, maybe it is at just an emotional level that happiness for them is is having the security that there is a community of people who have faith in a particular stagnant modeling of the world, that the model of the world, of course, probably never existed because these are fantasy models, but they believe them to be real. It's not a simile or a metaphor. It was like, it was like Napoleon saying, I am Caesar. It, not like, I am like Caesar, I am Caesar. So there, there is that kind of internalization that can go on and seems to be going on. Yes, yes. You're, you're tempting us uh, be into a political discussion of contemporary. No, no, I don't. I don't want to go there. But, but you know, we we may uh, go there a little bit in terms of the, the next uh, book, which is quite political, homage to Catalonia, which is another George Orwell. Uh, this is nonfiction as opposed to fiction, but it is a absolutely memorable. I can remember reading this very young as well. So I'd be very interested how old you were when you read this. And what what kind of influence it had on you at the time and now? It would so you know, clearly my mother put all her George L or L um, Orwell Penguin classics in order, so it would have been read <laughs> almost at the, at the same next to 1984. <laughs> <laughs> 1984. Uh, um, and uh, you know. It, that one was in a similar spirit to um, just realizing the world could be in a different, um, you know, in a different way, or there were um, there were realizable universes out there. Uh, so you should never take your own world for granted. What I took from the homage to Catalonia was it was the autobiographical aspect. Uh, I didn't um, until you reminded me rem remember it as an autobiography. I I thought it was just a story about a young man's adventures mm -hmm. watching the you know a war in in you know originally things that started in Barcelona. Um, but but the you know the thing for me was um, I could see me uh, in ten years time. And that there were different possibilities about the way you used your life, because um, I had assumed that I was going to be a good boy, and you know, um, probably thought at that time um, that I was going to be a psychologist um, uh, but because of my father's passion for um, mathematics. So, you know, I uh, probably already had committed to a life as a mathematical psychologist, or, like some kind of scientist involved in, involved in the brain. But you know, I was impressed by Orwell's sort of moral and political convictions you didn't have to do that you could just say no i'm leaving this country and i'm going to go uh, sure. you know, um so just a different way of scripting your life was a real thing and it actually happened and here was this eloquent young man talking right. about how you know how he chose to to spend and risk his life um you know at, at a time you know, when, when we were, well, I was at school, I had to make choices about exams and the kind of education and the career path that you, you, know, you were likely to pursue. And clearly those sorts of questions really did not bother George Orwell. You know, he was out there doing, doing the right thing, uh, you know, having adventures. Uh, he, he, he left Eton and went to Spain to join the uh, partisans there. I mean, one of the things I love about Orwell, and it comes out in homage, is his humility. He said, beware of my partisanship, my mistakes of fact and the distortions inevitably caused by having seen only one corner of events. There, there's there's a, a, a beautiful sense of humbleness in that statement. Because, it, you know, anyone who's been in a situation uh, like that knows 
that what you're seeing is not the whole context. Things that are going on or orthogonal to you are multiple. You have no knowledge of them. And so what you're, what you're reporting on is what you've experienced and what you've seen. And there are very few people, and Orwell was one of them, who was able to acknowledge, I can only tell you what I experienced, what I saw. And I can also tell you, beware of the propaganda from abroad written by people who have never been here, who have never been in battle, who have never seen the things that go on, because they have an agenda. Yeah. One, one of the things that uh, is interesting about Homage as well is his humor arises. I, I love this quote. For some reason, all the best matadors are fascist. <laughs> I, th I, I think, you know, I've been thinking about that. Maybe it's, it's the public display of the power to slaughter the bull in front of uh, a stadium, a stadium filled, filled full of people. <laughs> that would be attractive. Uh, there, there is a certain level of fascism in the Matador's role and performance. <laughs> a wonderful play of language. And the thing with Orwell is he's able to layer his observations with these kind of deep insights by just the right metaphor at the right time. Yeah. So Orwell also, uh, in addition to his reporting on the war, had things to say about the, uh, the ruling class in, in England. And I'm just wondering, as a young boy growing up, if, if that uh, had any impact at all. Uh, here's a quote on class. Whether the British ruling class are wicked or merely stupid is one of the most difficult questions of our time. And at certain moments, a very important question. I think it did, it did influence me. Um, I mean, it's difficult to, to say whether those books influenced me or whether I have chosen those books uh, because I have, <laughs> I have subsequently um, adopted a particular political and, and world view. Um, but I suspect the former. Um, you know, so, so, interestingly, your, your point about you know, beware um, the... Um, being partisan on the basis of, of you know the secluded amount of, of evidence that you gather from from um, you know from your exposure to the world, having you know. In contrast, um, I probably inherited a lot of my political views, not obviously from my parents, yeah, but also by just assuming that Orwell was right. Um, so you know, I subsequently grew up to be effectively a socialist um, yes. you know, of an understa understated sort. Uh, but if I had to commit to one side of the political divide or another, I'd certainly be um, in, in Orwell's di uh, direction, uh, simply because I, I, I took him at face value because of the honesty and the integrity of his writing, yeah. Uh, yeah. both the fictional writing, but also the, you know, you know, what struck me, you know, him writing about, you know, his own experiences as a, you know, as, as, as a young man. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, that autobiography uh, is an excellent example of honesty, brutal honesty. And, you know, he talks about when he was shot. He says two things went through his mind. First, his poor wife. What was she going to do? Her husband's killed now in Spain. Is my second thought was, this is just crazy. This is stupid. This is just some random shot of I'm standing in a trench. I'm not being heroic or anything. I'm just shot talking to someone. It is absolutely beyond my comprehension that I'm going to die in this stupid, pointless, senseless way. And all the nurses and all the doctors said the same thing. Anyone shot through the throat, they always die. You didn't die. You are the luckiest man alive. So there's Orwell saying, you know what? There is an, amongst the absurd, there's also random luck. I had both that day. The absurdity of being shot in the place I was shot at the time uh, along with the fact that I survived when I shouldn't have survived. 
I'd forgotten about that, but now you've reminded me. Yes, that was a very poignant part, part of Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Again, I think going back to uh, generating models is and again, it's generating models and then certainly go together in, in, in this way is that there is a degree of randomness and chaos and luck that's involved. And you find that in reading as well, that basically a character can have some either good luck or some bad luck. Things that are happening outside of his or her control. And whether Homage to Catalonia is one of those books, I think there's there's something to be said that there is a certain degree of random spin the wheel of you end up in Spain as opposed to Portugal or Thailand or wherever. And things happen there that would not otherwise have happened to you if you'd gone another way. It's the counterfactual again. So what we're learning then from your reading list is that there are a lot of counterfactuals that the characters and the authors are talking about. Yes. From Eddington to, to Orwell. So maybe there's a lesson here. That, delicious diversity. Yes. Uh, the diversity and the, the, the counterfactuals continue to proliferate if you allow them inside of a creative imagination found in the right series of books. Which leads us to Lateral Thinking, which is a nonfiction book by Edward de Bono. What, what was your age approximately when you um, came across this one? About 13. Um, so this was the the um, this was one of my mother's books, you know, you know um, a whole series of popular psychology books, but I remember that one in particular. Um, um simply um because it drilled down uh, possibly in a, in a sort of popular um psychology fashion um on how we thought and in fact it actually addresses exactly the the other uh, sort of the model building the creativity um uh, so the lateral thinking you know sure. could be read as just thinking outside the box gaining access in your head to that diversity, those counterfactuals you know, that, that, uh, that sort of enable you to render your understanding, your narratives, your model of the world generalizable and context sensitive. So I, I, I can't remember very much about it, but I do remember being intrigued by the importance of um, letting go of preconceptions and um, celebrating the brain as literally a fantastic organ, a, a generator of fantasies and hypotheses and counterfactuals to, to enjoy itself in thinking about different ways of solving problems or explaining explaining this and that. And it's certainly something which, um, you know, became a scientific question in later life, you know, thinking about how, how on earth do you get a computer to do this if you wanted to simulate aha moments of insight in silico you know, what, are, what, you know, what you know, how would you engineer that? What, what, you know, what, what are the principles that underwrite that kind of, that particular sort of creativity and imagination and resolution? So, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's, the creativity is almost paradoxically in finding simple solutions, you know, parsimonious explanations. Oh, it's just like that, deflationary uh, your know, explanations. So I, you know, I got a sense of that from from what I remember of um, sure. of, of, of De Bono's, Edward De Bono's um, natural thinking. Uh, for me, I, I read it quite young as well. Is it some ways it was kind of a simulation program of surprises of how to surprise yourself, and in, in some ways it's, it's like uh, test crashing a car to see what gets bent see what works, what does it, how you can make it a little bit stronger and better and so forth. And that lateral thinking was that way of testing the model that you have. And you test it in hard ways that surprise it because you know no model has all the answers. That at some point there's going to be model failure. And what you're looking for is how best, most efficiently, to get to that failure of a juncture and to learn from that and to 
by improving the model, go back through the process. And it's an, basically an indefinite process because the model never gets totally perfected. Yes. That's, that's one of the things I think I, I took away from that book when I was... Well, that, that, that's... In, I, I, you know, I, I'd forgotten that aspect, but you're absolutely right. And, uh, of course, that is exactly the structure learning we were talking about before. You know, testing against the evidence at hand, breaking the model, reassembling yes. it, adding little bits in or taking yes. stuff away. That is exactly the sort of, you know, the, um, the, the thing that underwrites how we learn to live in live in this world um, so so, that, so technically that would also be known as bayesian model selection where those hard tests of your hypothesis your explanation right. are essentially seeking out data that would disambiguate uh, between the hypothesis this is the right model or this is the wrong model right. so you know good informative data is often the data the evidence that destroys your hypothesis uh, breaks your model that road tests your car yes. in a destructive way, but then you know that was wrong, and then you yeah. move on to something which is, you know, so that, 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 I hadn't seen, got that perspective, I hadn't remembered that perspective, but it's, it, 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 it does feel absolutely right, you know, from a first principle account of, of, of sentient behavior, you know. Because in some ways, it, I mean, De Bono's book on lateral thinking kind of underlies the process of scientific thinking, which sets it apart. And maybe it's that kind of process that's difficult to communicate to a non-scientific audience. Because to think that there are people who are trying to break their models in a world where most people are trying to protect their models at all costs, you see that they're talking cross-purposes. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, if I was lecturing students in psychology or physics, I mean, you know, the whole point of a good experiment is it provides definitive evidence for or against your hypothesis. So good data is data that will actually um, enable you to move on from a particular hypothesis. So there's always there's always a counterfactual in science is the, the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. And what you want are those data that allows you to disambiguate. If you get some data and you're left 50-50, You've, that's a bad scientist. Again, it's just another way of saying asking the right questions. So, right. what is a question? It's just a move on the world to solicit some data which resolves your uncertainty. Uh, you know, I think that's a lovely description of the scientific process. Uh, right. Which, right. You know, um, begs the question. Um, you know, what, what what instances of people trying to protect their model or their ideology? Um, you know. Is, is that part of this sort of uh, confirmation bias and Bayes' optimal maintenance of a particular generative model? Maybe, you know, you know, the, 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 you know, if you can find the right environment and the right, and the environment or the culture permissively provides the right evidence, perhaps that's a viable solution as well. But of course, then you take away this context sensitivity, this counterfactual richness that we were talking about right. before, you can't generalize. You know, that 1984 utopia will work provided everybody commits to that and there are no external perturbations. There's nothing else in the universe that's going to go, come along and, and undermine it or recontextualize it. I think, and again, uh, your Markov blanket is a useful metaphor in this case, where if you have one that is so thick, it's impenetrable. It can't be changed. It's not subject to question and answer. It is the Titanic, it will never sink. Uh, as opposed to, I think, the scientific process, Markov blankets are like the universe. It can be in multiple shapes and configurations. And some we learn from better explanations are better shapes than others. But no one has the right to say one is the preferred, the only shape. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I was just thinking about... Um, a very thick Markov blanket. I'd never heard that before, but it's a lovely idea, which of course would would render you completely insular. You know, you'd yes. be isolated yes. beneath your very thick um, yeah. and you know, immutable, uh, unchangeable. Yeah. Um, and provided that thick blanket protected you from the rest of the universe, that would be fine. But of course, the universe is going to erode that blanket at some point. Yeah. Uh, and then you get this sort of, you know, this dynamic. 
So it's a very good point from the point of view of, of, of physics, because the whole point of the Markov blanket is that we're not islands. You know, we have to exchange with the world outside our heads, the world outside our communities. Sure. Uh, and if you're a cell, the world outside your cell boundaries. Um, we are open systems, and that, and that does require exactly this sort of transformation and trans uh, mutation and dynamics and reshaping of the Markov blanket to separate me from not me or yeah. you from not you. It, is, it, it did occur to me in, in your uh, earlier uh, conversation with me that there might be a range of these Markov blankets and that there may be an element of the population where that that blanket is so overwhelming, it can't be changed. And the other end, it's so fragmentary that it's easily destroyed. Either of those are not going to be productive of a, of a happy life, uh, of a life that's rich with texture and able to accommodate surprise and uncertainty. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, you can see examples of, of, of this all, all around you, you know. The, 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 the Markov blankets that, that are so friable, so labile, so capricious that they only exist fleetingly um, is a very different definition of things that dissipate, die and decay. Um, right. you know, so you know, all of those D words, which have negative connotations, are just descriptions of the dissipation of a Markov blanket, a, a thing losing its thingness uh, you know, as a Markov blanket disappears. So stuff that doesn't exist or decays or dies or dissipates very quickly, right. that's at one end. Stuff at the other end um, can exist, but it exists like a stone or a diamond for as long as it is allowed to exist and does absolutely nothing. And it's that, <laughs> that, that, that Goldilocks regime in the middle where, where, where we live, um, which is you know, not a stone, uh, but neither is it, uh, ni neither is it a, a forest fire. So. Yeah. Let's go to Lord of the Rings. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, growing up in uh, the countryside uh, in York. And that, you know, uh, as you probably know, J.R.R. Tolkien grew up in countryside in Worcestershire, outside of Birmingham. And in some ways, the Lord of the Rings is his um, perception of that childhood, of that place, of those people, of those times, the culture, the myths. And he brought in all of the myths with the Slavic, Finnish, Celtic, Greek, Norwegian. He was a great linguist at Oxford University. Uh, we had the chair there. And he, these books, I think, had a profound inf influence on uh, multiple generations. I'm not, I'm not certain if they're read today they, than they would have been in the past, but I'm very pleased to see them on your, your list because, uh, again, we're back to 1984. In a way, we're looking at symbols of power, sources of power, the most powerful people setting the communication moral agenda of what people can do, what they can think, and that the power in this case is one ring by someone who is power hungry, Sardon, uh, living in his castle in Moldor. And we have a small group from uh, the forest, the hobbits, Frodo and Sam, who venture out on a reverse quest which is a counterfactual, if you like. It's This is not Odysseus. This is the opposite. They are at home, unlike Ulysses, who was trying to get home. So being at home, they needed a reason to leave. And the reason to leave was to take the ring that Bilbo had given Frodo, his cousin, to go back. It was only one place where it could be destroyed, which was the center of this power. And the whole story is the journey back to Mordor in order to destroy the ring that threatens to destroy Middle Earth, which is where the hobbits live. So how old were you? Was this on your mother's bookshelf as well? It wouldn't have been amongst the psychology books, but where was no, it? Anyway. 
<laughs> uh, th- th- this was this was my book. Uh, I, so, um, and in a different way from 1984. You know, I think this is my first exposure to sort of the um, um, the fantasy literature, um, yeah. another world. So this was much more escapism. It wasn't about having your eyes opened. I recognise everything uh, that you know that Tolkien was writing about, <clears throat> whether it was the <clears throat> The countryside and idealized country, you know, countryside, you know, yeah. around the dragons' uh, homestead, um, or the mountains that I was familiar with, with the Pennines, and indeed with the you know, occasional trips to the Welsh mountains or the or the, um, or the Scottish mountains. Um, so, the, the, and also, I, I can't remember why, but I I also loved sort of. Um, Old English folklore and you know, the, the, the tales of, of of Sir Arthur and Merlin and the like. And you know, if I could have been one person at that age, I would have liked to be Merlin um, <laughs> as a teenager. Uh, so, but so the, the, all of these sort of um, notions and and narratives and the atmosphere um, and the you know the compass of this new world that, that, that Tolkien had created. Was fit very very comfortably with all the things that I that I loved, but it was somewhere you could escape to. Um, that had all the right ingredients, you know, the the, the, you know, the one ring, the simplicity, the you know, the uh, um, David and Goliath uh, kind of situation, the uh, overwhelming odds, uh, the heroic venture with uh, a small fellowship. And the, that within this fellowship, they could find the resources, creative resources, in order to overcome what seemed to be impossible odds. Yes. I mean, you know, the hallmark of a great story. <laughs> will they do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Will, will they succeed? Yeah. Where uh, rather than the uh, George Winston ending in 1984, where he says, I love Big Brother. Here, the Big Brother is in for a fall. And it, I mean, one of the things I think that's interesting about the, the Lord of, of the Rings is the symbolism of going back in England to really a pre Anglo Saxon England, before, you know, certainly before 1066 uh, with the Normandy invasion that there was a sense of people living with nature as part of nature, that really the the big changes came with the agricultural and industrial revolution, and and that that changed everything, that it took communities away from the forest, destroyed the forest, and that was, in a sense, uh, something I think that Tolkien regretted very much, The, the sense of if you want to just, that was the power. The new power was these new technologies that were coming in and and basically uh, changing everything and everyone. So I, there must have been changes that were going on when you were growing up in York as well, uh, in in the rural area. You could probably see even in your childhood that uh, things were not going to stay the same. Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, you know, my father was instrumental in that in terms of building uh, a lot of the infrastructure. So certainly in England at that time, that's when, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, the, the technology and uh, infrastructure, which we, you know, which we currently enjoy was being, was, was, was being assembled. So things were changing. And of course, mixed with the, the slight um, sadness that, course, that my father would have to leave the home to do that. So I, I didn't necessarily see this infrastructure building, this you know, the mechanisation um, um, of of England as as necessarily the best thing because it entailed the, the, actually the the absence of, of, of my father. So he's a younger man, sure. um, but you're absolutely right. And you know uh, another author I used to love was Thomas Hardy because it just took you before this time. It was just a much safer time. It always struck me that the the past is a much more comfortable, pleasant place to be. Because there really is no uncertainty about the future, because you know what happened, um, and certainly in this so pre-technological setting, I've always been drawn to dramas, and in an escapism sense, 
uh, stories and, and literature that, that is in a quieter, gentler, uh, more contemplative time, usually with lots of fields and grass and, and vegetation yeah. around. Well, the, th the thing about the past is that it's basically drained of most of the surprise because we know what happened uh, and what didn't happen. And there can be revelations that come up here and there that change our idea of what happened. And we may be a little bit surprised by it, but being surprised about a new piece of information from the past is quite different than being surprised about what's happening today or what may happen tomorrow to be prepared. To prepare yeah. for. I mean, just just to perhaps put this in context, at that time, you know, uh, the, there was CND and the Cold War, and I remember, you know, having um, government information films at school about what to do in the in the case of a nuclear explosion. So there was a genuine fear that the world was going to, sure. uh, certainly amongst my age group, probably sure. naively, there was a genuine fear that the world was going to explode. Uh, and you know, there were you know, watching pictures of nuclear bombs go off induced the kind of deep existential f fear and angst that you have during a nightmare. So there was, you know, certainly in the era of Thomas Hardy in Wessex or in, um, in Middle Earth, you knew there couldn't be a nuclear bomb. Um, but there were still great challenges ahead. You know, there were still sort of dramas and betrayals. And, and you know, so there was still... A really important narrative, but it was a. It, it certainly did not entail the kind of devastation that industrialization and technology, and certainly nuclear technology, would entail if it all went uh, went wrong. Right. Uh, in, 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 you know, at that point in in, in sort of um, English history. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well because I know you've written a lot about you know communication and, and the importance of that. Is that it's been said of, of Tolkien's uh, trilogy that he's really writing about the loss of communication between man and nature, that there were lines of communication and that it part of what he was trying to do was to write about that breakdown of the relationship between man and nature. And, uh, you know, with climate change these days, we can, we can see that actually uh, that breakdown has had quite significant consequences. If we uh, could move on to Lord of uh, the Flies, uh, from Lord of the Rings to the Lord of the Flies, I'm not certain if there's any perfect segue for those two titles, but uh, we're going to try our best. Were you living with your parents in York at the time you read this? Yes, yeah, about the same time. Um, probably a little bit older, because okay. I also remember um, doing that at school, or at least having uh, having discussions at school. So obviously, I got to the stage of um, doing my um, studies for English literature, um, but I had read it previously, um, and this was um, this this was at the tail end of my mother's collection. Um, but I think spoke very beautifully to psychology um, and you know the way that we relate to each other. Um, you know when circumstances when circumstances change. So this this was, you know, um, a portended um, a growing fascination with psychology and psychiatry. And eventually, I became a psychiatrist en route to um, uh, becoming becoming a theoretical uh, theoretical neurobiologist. Uh, so this this was this was um, an eye opener. Um, not in terms of the way that the the world works, but in terms of the way that we work. So for for me, uh, again, very a very compelling read. I mean, <clears throat> you read this as an adolescent, and really, it's a book about adolescence without adult supervision, of in a sense dividing into factions, and the factions might be called one would be maybe Ralph, who was more uh, of the for civilization and democracy and consent and uh, rule of law. And then of course there was Jack who was just the opposite, who was into hunting tactics, power games, domination. Uh, Piggy who was the intellect and the rationalist and Simon who uh, 
uh, was the incarnation of good and holiness. So we had all of the adolescent characteristics there uh, put together. And from, from your observations as a psychiatrist in the past, was it a re reasonably uh, valid look at how adolescents divide into factions and the kind of values that emerge from that? Yes, I, I think I think it is, and, and beautifully painted. You know, those different dimensions and aspects, and also very apt descriptions of all my classmates, the different classmates that you could be <laughs> at that time. And I have to say, almost to you, know, you had a choice. You could become any one of those people in, in in different contexts. So again, you know, different scripts for different ways of coping and coping here. Um, in a very changeable, unconstrained context where you were in charge. I mean, it certainly, um, it certainly was a, a, you know, a detailed picture of adolescence. But in many senses, one could imagine uh, grown-ups disintegrating in exactly the same way, you know, without the societal infrastructures and cultural constraints in play to keep us all together, or you know, on the, you know, reading from the same yeah. song sheet, or or him, him sheet, but certainly, um, you know, as an adolescent, um, it, it was a, a good library or repertoire yeah. of different ways of behaving. And I, I can remember, um, you know, w wanting to have mixtures of, 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 of the, you know, the, the key characters. And, and you know, uh, I was growing up at that time, um, having moved because my father was now building motorways in North Wales in England, so I moved to a, a different uh, uh, a different school where there were um, a lot of people. Um, where the nearest city was Liverpool, um, and some of them were, were, were beautiful characters, very you know sort of compassionate, um, some very religious, some you know hard people. Um, uh, so. The, 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 there was, uh, you know, there was a. Um, I was felt sometimes obliged not to be piggy, which was a natural right. tendency given my intellectual, sure. <laughs> intellectual sure. sort of leanings. So <laughs> I deliberately tried to be uh, unpiggy and, and learn. To smoke. <laughs> it, it took me. It took me about six months to smoke a cigarette without being sick, but I had to do it. it was, get, get that edge, <laughs> you know, so, like Jack might have appreciated. Um, so it was, you know, it was great to see that, you know, to see all these characters uh, or different ways of behaving, um, uh, you know, play out. But you know, also how they all those traits become very much accentuated and caricatured in their expression when the brakes are off. You know, when the context and the constraints are not there. You know, all the paranoias come in, and you know the outlandish, surprising ways of responding um, when you can't predict what is going to happen can sometimes lead to quite catastrophic outcomes. So you know, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting observation. I hadn't thought about that, but you're, you're right. It's, they, have to, they arrived with one script, but where they're in an environment where there were multiple scripts that could be used and there was surprise. And it's how they dealt with surprise on different scripts that led to the conflict, which is kind of interesting as well with Tolkien, who, who's in a sense created the Middle Kingdom that it's filled full of piggies and, and, and Ralphs, but the other characters aren't there. Jack is not there in Tolkien's idealized communication of man and nature. So there, there, is, there is that interesting juxtaposition of Lord of the Flies and Lord of the Rings. And one which um, I think certainly um, had more influence in terms of um, a, a scholarly and studied approach to personal interactions, you know, and, you know which, you know, you know, I should not have been surprised, you know, roll forward 10 years and I was studying psychology at university and then subsequently psychiatry as, as a practicing, uh, practicing clinician. So, you know, there, there was a richness there that was, um, 
possibly underwritten to a certain extent by reading those the, the, those books. And you know, the, another book I remember was Animal Farm you know, yes. you know, that, around that time, which, which seemed mm. to have the same sense to it. You know, the, the, you know, this is this is the, the disintegration of the psyche at an interpersonal level that could be afforded if you know, if all those constraints you know, aren't in play, or that harmony that Tolkien was restoring sure. in his long story um, was not was not you know, attained. Yeah, it's uh, again you know looking at, at uh, those books that we've discussed. It really is a question of of harmony's juxtaposition with power. And does power ultimately capture harmony for its own purposes and defines it in such a way, in an Orwellian way, that you have, it has the best of both worlds and everyone else has a script, which is the worst of all worlds, but it's their script and they believe in it. So there, there is, I'm glad we're, we're working on this metaphor of scripting because in a sense, what we've been discussing uh, in this conversation are the various scripts that appear in the, the literature here, the diversity of them, how the, in some ways it's the same script, but in different context. Yes. You know, suddenly in Lord of, uh, of the Flies, you have adolescent boys without supervision in a state of nature. What kind of disintegration happens and what scripts arise out of that? Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, uh, an American novel, a classic, which is on your list. Uh, again, about an adolescent going through a particularly difficult psychological time, being kicked out of his exclusive school in prep school in Pennsylvania and making his mission to save all of the innocent children of the world from going off the cliff through ignorance or their own innocence. So what drew you to this particular book? That was the book, the last book I read. So I've been in, in my late teens, if, if not early 20s then. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, I, I can't remember how I came across it, but you know, I, I do remember reading it while traveling. And I don't remember where I was traveling, but becoming absolutely engrossed. So that was one of those books you just couldn't put down. Uh, I don't know why it was so engrossing. It was, um, it had the same, um, the same kind of completeness that Lord of the Rings brings to the table in terms of defining a complete universe where you know, all the rules are known, mm. nothing is resolved, but all the contingencies are in play. And indeed, there was a little map in my version of Lord of the Rings. You could actually see where you were that yeah. was bounded. Um, uh, and in the same <clears throat> subtle way, but in a different way, um, I think Catch in the Rye had that, that this was you know, a little universe, which was, I, I can't remember now, because it's, as I say, more than half a century since, since, uh, since uh, or many decades since I read it. But it had that, it was, it's, this was a little island, a little bounded island of a few days in a young man's life, yes. where the author just got into that little island, that little yeah. sort of epoch. Yeah. It was completely self-contained, an episode. And you didn't have to worry about the, you know, the, you know, the past or the future. You just were in this particular bounded um, critique, description, uh, adventure within this within this epoch. And that was very comforting, but also very frightening because again, there's this sense of disintegration. So, I probably misread it. Um, um, what I what I remember from this was was, and it probably is again a made memory due to my psychiatric training later in life, but I remember it as basically uh, what we'd now describe as an early, you know, an early psychotic break. You know, a young man um, oh. experiencing the first psychotic break and disintegration again of the psyche, the, the, uh, the, uh, a disconnection of the, the, the connectivity that ties our world models together in, inside uh, our head. And all the, um, the delusional mood and the 
misperception or misperception of, of what matters and what's going on in just daily life and daily transactions with you know with relatives and, and friends and and teachers and indeed I think it was a, the one point ends up in a psychiatric asylum. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I remember it acutely because you know because of course I within within a few years I was actually dealing with these people, uh, you know, students at Oxford University who were experiencing the, the early um, symptoms of schizophrenia, going through very similar episodes right. of weekends. And you know, so it was just a very poignant, very personal, I thought it was almost autobiographical, but you know, obviously it wasn't, but it yeah. read as if it was. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, uh, again, it had, a, had a, an honesty in its disintegration and its chaoticness, which, which, which you know, uh, you know uh, as a student of the way things could go wrong, uh, that, you know, it was it was ex uh, you know very engaging. So it was obviously influential as well uh, in terms of career path and in terms of your your own modeling of the world, particularly adolescence in the world, would have been in a way modeled by Holden Caulfield and his uh, inability. Uh, to kind of accept a, a larger reality. There's one quote I'd like to, to share with you from, from the book, uh, which is, shows the, the quality of the writing and I, I think uh, the essence of the story. She wasn't doing a thing I could see except standing there leaning on a balcony railing, holding the universe together. That to me is the epitome of great art, putting the mundane with the sublime, the local with the universal, the ordinary with the meta, in one simple sentence, leaning against the balcony, holding the universe together. Somehow making that kind of a cosmic connection between two very disparate yeah. Again, you get your counterfactuals yes. it, yeah. put together in one sentence yeah. in order to make a profound point of the interconnection that goes on between counterfactuals. And, and perhaps that, it, it was that style of writing and that beautiful juxtaposition of things which just could not normally go together within our sort of, you know, our normative appreciation of the world, which made me think it was autobiographical. I mean, to have that ability, yeah. not dissimilar to the sort of lateral thinking, and yeah. certainly almost formally identical to something called um, Knight's move thinking or um, um, derailment in schizophrenia, where things, you know, things jump about and there are collisions and juxtapositions and associations that are completely implausible in one's normal internal narrative or indeed spoke, spoken yes. narrative. So the kind of the kind of um, thing that exactly is the, um, the the required to build a new models to, to be creative. So you know, I imagine it's the kind of thing that Van Gogh um, had in a visual uh, context. But oh, yeah. Yeah, music. Uh, yeah, the the, um, the, the, the the you know the the other thing about that particular example about the balcony and holding the universe together. Is that it has this sort of um, grandiosity of uh, you know, which again is a hallmark of certain kinds of psychosis, so manic depressive psychosis. That you know, the 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 the, the true or false impression that your you know, your your existence you know, matters in terms of you know, um, in a uh, you know, in a manic sense or omnipotent sense matters in terms of the existence of the universe but also um, notice within that holding the universe together that your influence transcends or encompasses yes. the entire universe a complete loss of boundary you know yeah. there is no boundary yeah. between you and you and then you get into notions for your notions of ego dissolution but sure. of course given our previous conversation the dissolution of the Markov blanket. Yes. And now you're, you're responsible for holding the universe together. Yes, exactly. The, the, so. the blanket dissolved. But yeah. it, therefore, a fraction of a nanosecond, it exists, and you see something you haven't quite seen before. It's, it, it's interesting. Uh, 
that line between imagination and schizophrenia, uh, where imagination at some point uh, along a continuum is no longer a healthy vehicle to resolve uncertainty. It is a vehicle that's basically the steering wheels coming off and the brakes don't work. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a very nice way of putting it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just on logical arguments, that, that has to be right in the sense that we still have people with this kind of psychosis in our population. So from an evolutionary point of view, that speaks to the fact there is something very adaptive about having a, t a schizotypal tendency. You know, there's something that promotes your ability to survive and to live in this culture, in this world, on an evolutionary time scale, if you've got this propensity for exploring counterfactuals that, as you say, you can go too far. So there's something, you know, there has to be something slightly schizophrenic about all of us if we're going to make a difference or indeed survive in, in, in this world. Um, but the, you know, the, when it goes too far, which is in, then gets into the, you know, the clinical domain, which right. I think, I think Holden probably, you know, if I read that now, um, <laughs> applied, you know, psychiatric criteria, I think, sure. be a clear diagnosis there. But it all, is all, all about coming back to, um, you know, sort of the reduction of uncertainty and inference. It's all about inference. I mean, you know, in a sense, what are delusions and hallucinations, if not simply falsely inferring something is there when it's not, uh, or what is an agnosia or, or a neglect syndrome, where you, you say, you know, this is not my arm or I can't recognize that, that person's face. So that's basically inferring something is not there when it is. But in both instances, it's, it's, it's a sort of a disorder of inference. It's a, you know, making the wrong sense of the sensory yeah. impressions. Um, you know, clearly, we have to suspend our um, commitment to the sensory evidence in order to imagine. Perhaps the most beautiful example of this is dreaming. So right. this is you know, something very close to the heart of uh, one of my um, most senior and close colleagues in, in consciousness and sleep research, Alan Hobson. So if you want simple evidence that the brain can construct its own realities and its own explanations for the world, then you need, need to look no further than dreaming. Um, and that this is you know, at the heart of consciousness and sentience. Uh, but that sentence is a you know, an active construction that the brain has generated where you use the sensory information during wakefulness, at least, to constrain and shape and do, do the structure sure. learning. It's a very delicate game. And if it goes wrong, you can easily see how you can fall into a state of psychosis. Um, and indeed, you can possibly even understand certain sleep disorders along those lines. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. But... It makes sense because in a dream state, uh, the uh, input from the world is is cut off. So what is being filtered in is not from experience. It's from the data banks of models in your head that then create their own counterfactuals without any kind of countervailing reality check with the evidence at hand. Yes. It's, it, so you can imagine that, that that's a nice example. Every night you put on a very, very thick Markov blanket. And yeah. you can, you're, you're sick well, that's what sleep is, is a thick Markov blanket. <laughs> <laughs> One that you can't throw off to cool down until you wake up. It's there. Yeah. And dreams are the hallucination from inside a thick Markov blanket. Alan Hobson would love that. I'll, I'll tell him that. <laughs> Okay, so we're coming then to the uh, human condition and Halden Caulfield and Catcher in the Rye, uh, where, let me give you a couple of quotes to remind you some of the nice parts of this book. The nature of truth. It's partly true, but it isn't all true. People always think something's all true. Again, one of those leaning on the balcony kind of statements, uh, the human condition. Among other things, you find that you're not the first one who was ever confused and frightened or even sickened by human behavior. 
and that goes back to some of the earlier books on the list as well, is yeah. that realization of the diversity of behavior and that there are things that are going on outside of York in places like Catalonia that I was never aware of. Far from the Maddening Crowd, Thomas Hardy. That's a, a book I'm familiar with. I went through a stage of loving Thomas Hardy, read everything. Uh, again, I think a contemporary of D.H. Lawrence and writing about uh, relationships uh, between the classes and, and particularly in, in Far From the Maddening Crowd, you have the, the, the wonderful uh, Bathsheba and her estate, a very accomplished, self-reliant woman who suddenly decides that she will risk everything for a rogue named Troy who really just cast his luck to the to the the fates and doesn't really take care of her but she's willing to risk everything for this even though there are people around him men around her who wish to court her but she will have nothing to do with them so we're seeing uh, in a way a kind of self-destructive streak uh, set in a class setting what was what was the the book far from the maddening crowd for you growing up? It was um, it was a in part escapism of the sort that one enjoys with um, with, with with Tolkien and, and you know the other um, you know sort of great fantasy like uh, stories um, or the inherits from the fact it was in, in past times, so you knew. Coming back, that you knew there were going to be no nuclear explosions or wars, so the, you know, the parameters were set. But within those parameters, there was uh, you know intense tragedy. You know, I think that the, the, you, pick, you, you picking up on the self destruction, um, you know that 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 was the tragedy, and certainly in the context of all the men who who could have made it all right. Sure, uh, that the self evident naughtiness of of, of Troy was it Frank uh, uh, of yes. Troy. And the, 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 you know, the, the, within the parameters of this little world, um, in the southwest corner of a rural England, um, sort of took on a magnitude which was quite horrifying. You, know, you just couldn't couldn't believe it was getting worse and worse. How awful this Troy was, particularly for, from. Uh, I do remember fe feeling very sorry for, for Gabriel. You know, the, yeah. I do remember the the opening the opening thing where, where, where he loses his sheep. And that was horrible as well because I, I used to love animals. I wanted to be a vet at one point. Yeah. Um, you know, so this sort of um, getting back to the Yorkshire Moors um, aspiration was was underneath a lot of this. Um, but the, 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 you know, the, it was the it was for me again the perversity of um, um, a failure to properly um, develop a theory of mind or infer the intentions and the nature of another, and by ascribing them inappropriately, the attributes that you would have of Sheba would have had to to Troy. She failed to infer what kind of person he was, and you know. And unfortunately, had to witness the evidence towards the end of the story that she, he wasn't the kind of person that she was. So, you know, it's a failure yeah. of a shared narrative um, in, a, in, in a in a romantic and uh, and interpersonal sort, um, yeah. which you know is irresistible. Uh, you know, as a story, as long as it doesn't happen to me. Or yeah, you. <laughs> well, in, in, a, in a way, far from the maddening crowd, you know, the central heroine there. You, you can see that the deficiency is she didn't have appropriate scripts to model the world of men and what the capabilities were and what the dangers were. Her model was inadequate and she was an, unable to ask the right questions in order to update that model. And so she just got deeper and deeper in holding on to the model that she knew, even when it was clear that it was failing her she was unable to let it go. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, naivety um, we, of the sort that inherits from not having access to those counterfactuals. So, had she read Thomas Hardy, she'd have been fine. <laughs> 
Hey, Judd the Obscure, I would recommend. <laughs> so it, uh, the book kind of ends with the world is largely made up of compromise. And the, the compromise, I take that to mean in a, in a larger sense, maybe a little bit like leaning on the balcony uh, kind of metaphor, is that the, the compromise is with your ability to control the scripts of others and your uh, perhaps inattentiveness in updating your own scripts in order to have a more meaningful, effective way of communicating others what you intend, what your motives are, what you wish to see happen. Yeah. That, that was wonderfully put, and in particular that notion of updating your own scripts as part of that, um, I would say, existentially necessary um, um, way of, of um, updating your world models. So that actually that word updating uh, plays a really central uh, role in formal mathematical descriptions of model optimization structure and it's called Bayesian belief updating. It is literally um, updating your belief states on the basis of evidence. So you know this is this is com if compromise is basically being able to accumulate and assimilate evidence in the service of updating your belief space in belief updating in order to improve or optimize your model of the world, then compromise is, is if you like, an entirely and complete description of the way that we live. Yes. And, 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 and another one is perhaps a little darker, is that the compromise of the updating of your scripts is also dependent on the power of whatever uh, mondo you're living under, yeah. uh, that somehow the updating isn't equal across the board. And I think it's important to understand that culturally, that updating process is viewed in very different ways and has been done historically. Well, the power is the environment. Yeah, it is, absolutely. Terribly, what we would hope is not... So you won't find uh, you won't find an Orwellian utopia in, in Wessex, though. That is why <laughs> this is why it's so nice to read Thomas Hardy. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a delightful conversation, Carl. I very much appreciate you coming on the show and sharing with us your your in depth knowledge of science, of neurology, of mapping of the human brain. Uh, we could go on for a very long time. You've added a lot. Uh, the books you've chosen are classic, and I hope that the viewers will appreciate the insights that you've brought to those books and to the general conversation on how we use books to model our world and how that model influences who we are, what we are, what we see, and what we want. That was a lovely closure. I greatly enjoyed talking to you. <laughs> we talked about all my favorite things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You have a great day, and I will let you know when the show is up. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.